Yes. Yes. Can you address that? Yes. And, you know, I, w- I would suggest if you want a proper commentary on that parable, I would suggest two people. The one is William Barclay. He's got commentaries on the whole New Testament, and he, he's got some good things to say about that. And the other person is Robert Capon. Um, he, he's got a book called. Grace, Kingdom, and Judgment, in which he just deals with all the parables of Jesus from from a perspective of God's amazing grace and and kingdom grace and judgment by Robert Capone. Um, But here's my take on it. Um, We We often want to read a portion of Scripture and we want that sentence or that paragraph to teach us everything about everything. And I think we've looked at that parable and we thought this is Jesus' eschatological pronouncement of the end of the ages of how it, things work. But if I think the, a, a better way to look at all these parables, and this is what these theologians do quite well, is to first of all consider the environment in which he spoke, the circumstance in which he was speaking, who he was speaking to. And in this particular instance, we will find again, it was a very specific crowd of religious leaders, a crowd that was always putting boundaries between us and them. And we are obviously the ones who are in, and they are obviously the ones who are out. And so in speaking to a community that's divided in their own understanding, the only time he ever warned people about their consequences is when they were telling other people (laughs) that they are out and we are in. And you need to convert to our way of understanding things and thinking of things before you can be in the in crowd that's on God's side. Otherwise, you remain on the out side, which is on the devil's side. And so, uh, a few things that I can remember uh, William Barclay say, where he speaks about the goats that goes into uh, eternal, is the words we've translated it, which is much better translated, um, can I say, absolute. It's the, uh, instead of, we read that word eternal and we think that it speaks of never-ending time. Um, However, and this is why many of the new translations has changed that word, because so often in the Old Testament, the word eternal is used this city will be destroyed eternally and then three generations later you find it's rebuilt and they're carrying on in it. Okay? Or uh, Jonah said the, the, in the belly of the fish that the gates of Hades, the gates of hell, has closed upon me eternally. But his eternity lasted three days and then the fish spew him out. So, okay, do you see that we, we often want to put meanings onto words that if we go back to the text and we read the whole story, we see in the context of the story, we shouldn't impose just single words and tell a different story. So in the context of the story, eternity is often a period of time. And and so it it speaks about God's absolute... uh, It's a, a period that only God can assign. The word, um, what we've in some translations said, destruction, the goats go to eternal destruction. William Barclay brings out the beautiful meaning that that word is always used throughout the New Testament as remedial. In other words, it's not destructive or eternal punishment. So he would say it was, his eventual translation of that is the goats going to, a time of discipline. 
That is his way of interpreting that specific scripture. But let's look at the whole story. Um, And in the same context, Jesus, uh, I think it's just before, after, he he tells a similar story and he says, um, you you know, um, in that day, my father's going to say to to many, um, come and enjoy This amazing feast because, you know, I was naked and you clothed me. I was in prison and you visited me. I I was sick and you cared for me. And they'll say, where did we see you sick or in prison or or, or all of that? And And his message, the overarching message that he's trying to communicate is this. What you've done to the least of these, you've done to me. So imagine the whole story again. He is speaking to a specific crowd who delights in their doctrine of separating us from them. And he's telling them (laughs) that what you do to anyone, in fact, what you do to the least, you do to me. So his warning is not, be careful that you don't see me in too many people. His warning is, do not miss me in the most unlikely candidates. Do not miss me in the criminal in prison. Do not miss me in the out-and-out homeless guy. Um, Don't miss me there. His whole message is, you know, your very obsession to separate yourself from others is what's going to cause your time of separation to be disciplined and brought into a place of to be restored. (laughs) Um, But I would recommend go get William Barclay and and Robert Capone on those parables. And then in all those things, I think we have often taken certain parables spoken to a certain crowd and we wanted to make it the overarching theology for everything. And we will understand it much better if we see who was Jesus addressing and why was he addressing them and for what purpose did he address them. Secondly, I will say the cross changes everything. Because the the cross, I mean, remember that parable, the, the king that was far away, the servants that are murdered, eventually the son is murdered, and they say he must come and judge them and utterly destroy them. Now, In the parable, Jesus just leaves it there. If we didn't have the cross, we might think that that is the whole story. But the cross comes to subvert our ideas and says, yes, you've messed up, just like the story I told you. But your judgment and your opinion that I should come and judge, no, I am coming to reveal to you something you've never imagined. And that is even when you utterly deserve my total condemnation. I will justify you. Because I will have mercy upon whom I want to have mercy. And I will will not allow sin and evil to dictate to me what I should do. And although sin and evil dictates your judgment, hey, I'm God and I will love you if I want to. (laughs) <laughs> and he wants to awesome any other question we are going to um, tomorrow look at the depth of his identification with us the incarnation the level to which God has taken the initiative to unite himself with you Hey, God is so excited about you. Mm. Yes. I've got a friend back in the Midwest who's going through some tough times. He's Mm. going through a lot of stuff he's created himself. Yes. And he points out scriptures to me about it. So God chastises those who he loves. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I haven't heard back from him yet, but if any, any other news there to 
Yes. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Can't can't agree more more with that. Um, I think ultimately, I I always refer back to the cross, and and I say this is God's final word, and this is the place where we more than ever before deserved the utter judgment of God, and the judgment was clear: you you deserve death, and yet. In, at that very point where we deserve our worst, he gives us his best. And it's absolutely undeserved in terms of we didn't earn it. Now, there's a difference between what you deserve and what you are worth. I think that's maybe a clue here as well, because we, um, we often look at the terminology that speaks about the wages of sin is death. Uh, Paul says, there's nothing good in me. You know, that what you deserved in terms of your good performance, God would still be justified to just judge you. But there's, there's a difference between what you deserve and what you are worth. God sees value in, in humanity to such an extent that he comes and wastes his own life upon us without any thought of uh, or, or guarantee of return, he just considers us worth himself. <laughs> That's why he gives himself. Um, I, I think of Paul. Paul, uh, I'm so glad he lived the life in which he demonstrated what he taught as well and and Paul's life wasn't always smooth or always just, you know, no problem. So this suffering that uh, undoubtedly is just brought about by our own choices, our own ignorance, uh, sometimes not just ignorance, our own stubbornness and stupidity. They, you can bring suffering. I can think of many things I can do right now that will bring me great suffering and it will be stupid of me to do it. Um, the only suffering that has got any value, and this is also where we've got to look at the suffering of Jesus and see that there's nothing, um, uh, can I say, redemptive or sacred just about the act of suffering. That suffering was unjustified and it was wrong. And evil finds evil's purpose is to make us suffer. Now, Jesus did give himself. God provided himself as a type of sacrifice. But what is different about his sacrifice and our understandings of sacrifices is he gives himself willingly um, and he gives himself for our benefit. In other words, our ideas of sacrifice is we do something to please God. God says, now my idea of sacrifice is I willingly give myself to benefit you. Now, in the context of a God who gives himself for our benefit, what kind of sacrifice are we going to give? To, to change him or to manipulate him. Now, this, this is a different kind of suffering that Jesus enters into. It's a suffering that's for the benefit of others. So the only time that I see Paul suffering is when it is for the benefit of others. So Paul didn't think his own personal suffering is God's way of um, just uh, dealing with him. Uh, I see him being beaten. I see him going through shipwrecks. I see him wash up on that one island with a snake biting him. And, you know, if Paul subscribed to many of our doctrines, this would have been the ideal time for him to ask, am I in God's will? <laughs> Is God for me? But... In the midst of, I think if he asked that, he probably would have fallen down dead. But, but Paul, in the midst of all this contradiction, 
realizes that there is only one event that reveals the heart and attitude of God towards me. And that's the event in which God would rather suffer with me and for me than forsake me and give me what I deserve. And so he, he just shakes the snake off. Because he knows beyond a doubt, God has proven that he is for me. He is for me. And so the other thing that I can also suggest is God primarily um, corrects and teaches with his word. He speaks to us. He communicates to us. And he has spoken so clearly in his son. Now, yes, sometimes if I ignore what he said, I will experience the consequences of of me ignoring him. But once again, if my son climbed that uh, wall and fell down, I wasn't going to say, well, that's just your own fault. You ignored me. I'm going to be right there and say, I didn't want the suffering and I don't want it now. This is not me disciplining you. This is me trying to help you, heal you, restore you, do whatever I can to embrace you into perfect health. Again, hope that helps a bit. Thank you. Anything else? Glory, I look forward to an exciting time tomorrow. Did you learn something today? Awesome, awesome. Such a privilege to be with you all. Thank you for your warm welcome.